Coming up on iOS today, we have all the tips you need to get to Inbox Zero, or at least organize your email. Stay tuned for iOS today. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash iOS Today and use code iOS Today for $100 off select mattresses. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to iOS Today, the show where we talk about all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, iPad OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer, and we love to talk about them to get the most out of all of those awesome Apple devices you have. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Rosemary Ochert. Hello, Rosemary. How are you today? Oh, I'm good. We've got a great show lined up as always, but uh, this one was especially fun to prepare. You know, Rosemary is incredible. We know that. That's a given, but uh, is doubly incredible because I said to Rosemary, okay, so we want to talk about email, but the problem with email is now everybody's going to see all of those emails I get from the uh, foreign prince who wants to help me get like a billion dollars. And I really don't want people seeing my uh, my bank account information as I'm sharing it with the, the princes who are giving me money. And Rosemary said, we can fix that. And I said, how? And she said, well, I've already created a test email account. And I said, you're incredible. So I'm really excited to talk today about email and not have this concern for um, personal details being shared. Uh, so we were kind of inspired, I know, Rosemary, by uh, folks talking about um, wanting to figure out how to sort and filter through their email and what apps they can use. So I think we'll both be talking a little bit about the apps that we use. And then also Rosemary is going to be giving us some tips on how to actually uh, kind of better your email and make it a little bit easier to use. Because I've got a few friends and family who are going, uh, 9,999 unread emails in your these, inbox. Exactly, exactly. And I'm like, you don't have to live that life, I promise. Um, so let's start with the app that comes built into uh, many an iOS device and the app that many people use, given the fact that it does come built into your iOS device. That, of course, is mail.app, the app by Apple. Yes. Yeah. So mail.app, I'm sure most people are familiar with it, is a, a pretty basic email application. Once you're in an email, by default, it shows you the ability to archive an email, move it to a different folder. Uh, I'm going to cancel that. And of course, create an email. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, there's reply. Um, but there's a couple of things that people might not realize here. So for example, there is a filter button down here in the bottom left-hand corner. And it's there on the iPhone as well. I've set everything up on my iPad for today. If I do this, I just see unread emails, which means that I can easily, oh yeah, you can swipe. Did people not know that? There are some people who do not know that you can swipe and that also allows you to do things like mark as read. But if you're looking here and going archive, I don't want to archive things. I want to delete things. Deleting is my game. Then you should pop over into the settings app for mail. And then if you go into accounts, you'll see I've got several accounts here. I'm going to go into my testing account and then tap on the account among other things, you can change your name and everything. So if you want to be uh, Prince Micah, you can be Prince Micah. Um, <laughs> but you can also change um, whether or not you are discarding messages into deleted or archive. Now, if you have a lot of email, you're probably going to want to just go ahead and archive everything because then it's still there. You can find it. It's not going away. It's just not in your inbox anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I much prefer having the option to delete emails. Um, and that should mean, oh, sorry, I forgot. Once you've done that, you need to go back out of your account settings and tap done. Otherwise, it doesn't change anything. Um, and then, um, why is this not updating? I'm just going to pop back in there and double check that I did that correctly. It's advanced. Yep. Deleted email inbox. Tap done. 
I may just force quit mail and pop into it. There we go. And now uh, if I swipe, I have a trash in Servant Archive. And similarly, I've got a bin up here in the top right-hand corner or trash if you prefer. Um, but, you know, mail is pretty good, especially if basically all you want to do is read email, reply to email and so on, uh, then that's great. Um, so uh, there are um, a couple of problems maybe with mail. Uh, so say, for example, you know, you, you want to, I don't know, print something um you you can print uh if you tap on the reply button why is this hidden under reply i'm not sure somebody <laughs> at apple made some design decisions there you can print but from here you can also make pdf um, and i'm sure some people don't know this but if you pinch to zoom on that print preview you get a pdf which can then allow you to save an email so say for example you've got some invoices and you need to make sure you've saved those then you can use that pinch to zoom option um, to, to you know, uh, actually save that as a PDF. Uh, similarly down here, if you've got one sender that just keeps bugging you and bugging you and bugging you, but you don't want to get rid of them entirely, you can mute them. Um, you can also say, hey, actually do notify me about this person. Um, and uh, of course there's reply and reply all. Um, and for people who aren't aware, the difference between reply and reply all is if there are other people that have also received this email that I can see um, the, the uh, email addresses of because they would be here in this two field. When I do reply all, it goes to all of them, including the original sender. And this can be really useful to say lots of people are using uh, email to plan a, a meetup to say go bowling or something and you all want to do a thing. And somebody suggests, hey, let's go bowling. If you just reply to the original person, obviously, they're the only ones that knows about it and they have to handle all of the coordinating. Whereas if you hit reply all, you're sharing that burden. Uh, <laughs> if there is an email that comes to you that says that there is cake in the kitchen at the office, don't hit reply all with your thanks. Uh, that's a piece of advice brought to you by a previous piece of life, life experience uh, right there for free. Um, and ooh, wow, something is coming up on Apple TV. Well, I guess I'll go look into that later. But yeah, so this is mail that up. Uh, don't forget, you've got an edit button so you can go through and uh, handle multiple emails, choosing to mark them as read, move them to junk, flag them, straight up trash them, or just move them. Um, and of course, once you're in edit, you've got an option to select all. If you decide, you know what? I do have too many emails in my inbox. This is okay. You can go ahead and move them to somewhere else. Nice. Now, does mail.app um, on the iPhone have many filtering options? And of course, you and I both know that the answer is no, not really. Not really, uh, no. We, we should talk about this. For folks who are wanting to uh, do some of the filtering options that are available on the Mac with Mail.app, you can also go to iCloud. So if you go to iCloud.com um, and log in with your iCloud account, you can log into the, the, you click on the little Mail portion and it will give you some of those magic filtering options that you get when you are using the Mac client. Um, I don't know why those all still haven't been brought to uh, iOS. So but. there's a little bit of a difference there, actually, Mike. Okay. Um, and because some people might be thinking, wait, I don't have iCloud email. I've got Gmail or I've got a uh, fast mail or proton mail or something. I, I can't do that with iCloud.com. No, you can't. You need to go to Google uh, mail.google.com or protonmail.com, fastmail.com, wherever it is, um, because those are server side filters. Um, and the difference between server side filters and the filters in mail on the Mac is the filters in mail on the Mac only work when mail on the Mac is running. So if mail on the Mac is not running, those filters do absolutely nothing. Um, or if your Mac is offline, it's asleep, it's out of battery, whatever it is. Um, but, um, you know, if, if, so if you've got, if you're just using Apple's mail, so you've got an at iCloud.com address and at me.com address and at Mac.com address. Oh my gosh, you wonderful piece of sunshine, you. Um, then uh, you can go ahead and change those over iCloud.com. Or if you want to try beta.icloud.com, then there's a slightly different UI there. Um, and it shouldn't mess with any of your settings, not in my personal experience anyway. That's good. Um, now let's talk about an incredibly popular uh, mail app that, uh, or I should say mail service that I think a lot of people use and one that 
I have so many different filters set up for. This thing saves me all the time, every time. Um, and I, frankly, I really enjoy the way that it makes uh, filtering very easy. And you gave some great advice uh, last week at the end of the show uh, to our TD, Anthony, uh, about how to... Uh, maybe sort of say, okay, past a certain point, I don't need these emails and everything since then is good. Um, this is Gmail and yep. let's hear what your thoughts on Gmail in general. And then also kind of your, your tip that you gave for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, some people might be thinking, oh, Gmail, I don't use Google. I can't use the Gmail app. Uh -uh. You can. So if you pop into the, oops, uh, I didn't want to create a new label there. Sorry, if I tap on my account option, then I can add another account. And you'll see that there's options to set up all kinds of accounts. If you've got an Outlook account, Office 365, Yahoo, even iCloud and other IMAP um, uh, uh, accounts, you can add all of those here. Um, and you can also toggle accounts on and off. So you can see I've got some other accounts there. Um, which I could turn on if I wanted to. Uh, somebody's just sent me an email saying iOS today is awesome and there's cake in the break room. Darn it, Micah, I really need you to fix that teleporter. I want the cake. <laughs> Wait, uh, it's not in this break room. So yeah, maybe it'll be there the when I get done. <laughs> the cake, uh, is, the a cake lie. is a lie. The cake is a lie. No. Um, but, you know, Gmail is great because um, as well as, of course, having native swipe options like this, if I pop over into the uh, the three or the burger icon over on the left and go into settings, then I can change these mail swipe, action, swipe actions. So I can say, instead of archiving, I want to mark it as red or unread or snooze. And snoozing is something that you can't do in the native mail application, but oh my gosh, I love that feature. So oh, it's cake in the break room, right? I could go ahead, you know, I can print this and so on, um, but I can also snooze this message um, and I can pick a date and time. So I am going to pick in about uh, an hour or so because I'm going to want to go and get that cake when we are done with the show. And so that email is going to come back then because then I will know. Um, so uh, yeah, um, you know, that that is a feature that you can do. Now, obviously, um, they, there's also the, the way Google handles things. So there are these smart features. Um, so it can automatically categorize emails as social or um, there's also a promotion. So you'll see some emails from a, a podcast. Uh, this is safe. Come on, Google. Google is my power user. She's Stephen Hackett and uh, David Sparks. I, I trust both of those people. Um, if I weren't for them, I wouldn't be a podcaster, actually. So there we go. Um, but, um, you know, if you turn these filters on, it will go through and try and move everything into the right categories. So you might have seen a lot of newsletters over the last year or so say, make sure that you go ahead and you look in the promotions category for our special emails or things like that, or your social emails and so on. Um, and it also means that you can have notifications just for high priority emails. I'm actually going to turn that off because I don't need that. Now, what I suggested to Anthony last week after the show um, was he said he had a lot of emails mm -hmm. in his inbox. And I said, I think, um, and I think the number was 4,756,924 emails. Uh, probably at least that, maybe double. <laughs> um, so, I'm sure Anthony is somewhere going, no, it was like a couple of thousand. Um, 3,377. Um, there you go. There wow. We, uh, less than what Micah said. Um, eh. So what you can do is if you go over to Google Mail on the web, so that's mail.google.com, you can create filters. And one of the filters or kinds of filters you can create is the based on date that it was received. So what you can do is you can find everything received before a certain date. So say before seven days ago or before a month ago, and then you can mark those as read and archive them. Um, and this is also the start of the way that you create a filter. You start by doing a search um, and then over by the search option, then there will be a filter. Now you can't do that here. So I'm just going to search for a clothing store that I know has been sending me a whole bunch of email recently. Hey, look at that. Um, and uh, you'll see here, I have no options to create filters. That's because the iOS app, it's not exactly you know weak. It's just that they don't have all the features here because, well, they want you to go to the website and do it on that instead. But if, if you're looking for a service that can do a lot of filtering, Google Mail is pretty good for that. Um, it, it's not perfect, just like everything else, um, but uh, you know it, it, it works nicely. And I have to say, I personally do like the iOS app. Uh, one feature I should have mentioned, actually, um, and so I will just uh, 
pop back in here is there are some options to reply um, to emails really quickly. So I am just going to uh, go into all mail, which includes my archive mail. And you can see here, the one from James is, um, is snooze. If I hit reply, then when I start typing, then it would, if somebody had asked me a question, set, uh, show me some options to autocomplete. So if somebody had said Wednesday or Thursday, it would give me an option to say Wednesday is great or something like that. And that is amazing. Um, and of course you can add attachments, you can schedule your send as well. Um, that's something that uh, I think people frequently look for. Mm -hmm. um, now this may depend on your service provider, but being able to schedule your send means that I could be working at 10 o'clock in the evening, but my boss doesn't need to know that because I can schedule the email to go at eight o'clock tomorrow morning while I'm still napping in bed. Mm -hmm. And then my boss gets the email at eight o'clock in the morning and thinks, oh, wow, Rosemary's such a good employee. She's getting up early and getting on with things. The real answer is that I'm working very late at night, but he doesn't need to know that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's also um, some, some other options there depending on what exactly it is that you are trying to do and which service you're using. But I have to say I, I like Gmail. I agree. Um, you know, it, as long as you are well aware of uh, how Gmail works and what it does and what uh, trade-offs you're making, I think that uh, Gmail is really good at what it does. And so that ends up being um, kind of my account for my email account for uh, all sorts of things. I want it, I want it to be the one that I use to um, to to take on different social media accounts, et cetera, uh, just because it does a good job of organizing the emails as I need them and uh, getting rid of the ones that I don't, whether that be through an unsubscribe option or through just uh, marking as read and archiving automatically. Um, the next one on your list is one that, uh, so I used to be an airmail user and we will talk about that one in a second, uh, but I uh, switched from airmail to Spark um, and Spark is an interesting email uh, application in that it does something kind of special that uh, not all email services providers do. Um, what it's so so a typical email provider uh, an application you will log into your email account and it will use the pop3 or imap settings which are just these uh, means of conveying email along to you from the the server uh, to take in your email and and show it to you uh, what spark does is a little bit different it imports your email uh, into its servers and then shows you them from there. And the reason that it does that is because it gives them the ability to offer some features that you wouldn't, that you won't find elsewhere, including one of my favorites, which is at any time you can create a link to an email that you have that you can then share with other people so that they can see that email as well. So I've used it in the past when I needed to, I, like I got an email uh, for Twit and it had something to do with maybe somebody wanting to be a guest on a show or what have you. I could create a link to that, pop it into our Slack and anybody could open that up and see what that email said. Um, that's a really handy feature. Uh, and then, you know, you could remove that link later as you needed to, et cetera, et cetera. So I really like Spark for that. Plus, uh, it ends up making these snooze features a lot better uh, because of the way that it's set up with the server. And also, uh, syncing across different uh, devices ends up being a lot better uh, because of the way that they, they do the way because of the way that they do their email stuff. Um, and then. The one feature I don't use that is a really popular reason to have Spark is uh, what's called Spark for Teams. And what that does is it lets you essentially turn your email into sort of a, a team effort. So for example, uh, with Rosemary and I, we could have a Spark email area that is uh, feedback that comes in from uh, for, for iOS today, which, you know, questions and things like that, those would pop up there. And then we both would be able to interface uh, with those and interact with those and have a, a team section. I've just never really used those features because I didn't need them personally. And I was more, I was more drawn and continue to be drawn by Spark's other features. So that, yes, that is the, the mail app that I use. Um, but I'm curious, uh, Rosemary, if you have some other thoughts about Spark. 
Well, one of the things that I love about Spark as well is you've got this option to toggle on and off a smart inbox. Um, and so if you toggle the smart inbox off, you've just got this, this straight chronological view. If you toggle it on, though, it shows you things like newsletters. It, it, the next section here is seen because I've seen all of these emails. Um, but uh, if I had personal emails coming in here, then it would filter those out into personal and so on as well. Um, and it does have a sort of calendar option where you can set it up with your calendars as well. As you can see, my test account has precisely nothing on the calendar because a, a test person doesn't really you know do a lot um but of course in the settings there are some other options um where you can change how smart inbox works um you can change your email viewer and you can even personalize the toolbar as well so say for example i want delete to be in here and i actually want it to be in front of archive i can do that um, and make sure that that's there um and there they even have testing features as well but now down here at the bottom i've got a bin which I didn't have before. Um, and of course, they've got the, the snooze option and everything as well. Um, I do also like how they pin things. So if I pin something, um, then that that's the equivalent to starring or flagging elsewhere. But I do kind of like the idea of it's pinned. Uh, and then I can go into my pins, of course, at any time and see that. Uh, and if I want to, then I can easily swipe and unpin. And of course, like everything else, you can you can change those swipe options. Spark is one of those uh, apps that I come back to regularly because I like it. It's very pretty. It does exactly what I need it to do. Um, and uh, it also lets me swipe through my emails, um, you know, left to right, um, which is is pretty nice. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it's not one I use every day. We'll get to one of those in a minute. Um, but uh, it is a great uh, app. Agreed. Uh, that is, again, uh, Spark which is uh, my day-to-day -day app of choice. Um, I think we'll take a quick little break here before we come back with uh, a few other uh, things to talk about in terms of email. Um, but I would like to tell you about a sponsor here for iOS Today that will have you sleeping soundly. Folks, it is Casper. Love your tomorrow with Casper. The new Casper Cooling Collection has everything you need to help you sleep cool all night long. Casper's mattresses with new snow technology, hyperlight sheets, lightweight duvets, and breathable mattress protector, they're all designed to keep you cool and comfortable so you can't help but love your tomorrow. Tomorrow is a new day, so you can make the most of it with Casper's new cooling collection. There's Casper's Wave Hybrid Snow Mattress, which keeps you cool for 12 plus hours, pulling heat away from your body for sustained temperature regulation, a cool to the touch feeling, and a much improved tomorrow. And better bedding makes for a better tomorrow, which is why Casper's Hyperlite sheets are designed with an innovative grid weave that lets air flow through for maximum breathability. The lightweight duvet provides optimal temperature control without sacrificing plush comfort. And Casper's breathable mattress protector, which is not something you would expect from a, a mattress protector. It's breathable. This is great. It improves the coolness of the bed even further by allowing air to flow between your body and the mattress. All of these are designed to work together to prevent overheating all night because cooler sleep means better sleep and better sleep means better tomorrows. I love my Casper mattress. Uh, I've got the Casper mattress, Casper pillows, Casper sheets, Casper uh, foundation, the Casper bed frame. I've got so much Casper stuff. And the reason why I keep going back and getting more Casper stuff is because it's great. And I look, I used to do a podcast about sleep and have done a lot of research on sleep science and, uh, you know, new sleep studies that are coming out all the time. And so because of that, as a result of that, um, sleep became all the more important to me as I learned how much of an effect it has on the body. And so given how important sleep is to me, I wanted to make sure that the mattress I had was uh, helping along with the sleep and not hurting it. And that is why I went uh, for Casper. As always, Casper offers free shipping and free returns. Uh, so you, you probably come to, to know that about Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. You can focus on tomorrow and let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, the mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash iOS today and use code iOS today for $100 off select mattresses. That's code iOS today for $100 off select mattresses. Exclusions apply. See casper.com for details. And thank you, Casper, for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today. 
All right. Tell me about, uh, well, I think this is a pretty uh, well-known app among power users in particular, and it's still one that I keep on my phone and iPad uh, and Mac because of how powerful it is. And occasionally I might need something from this app that I don't get elsewhere. It's Airmail. Tell us about Airmail. Yeah. Yeah. So Airmail is an app. Um, it, it's had a bit of a bumpy history, but I have to say, uh, especially over the last couple of years, it's got way more stable and it works really well for me. So to start with, Airmail is an, an email application, but there's already a couple of things in the user interface which might make you go, huh? And that's, for example, there's this little swipe option underneath a day where I can actually archive everything I've received on one particular day. So if I go, wow, I had a lot of important email, I can just go ahead and archive all of it. Um, it also bumps the unsubscribe button for newsletters right up to the top, which is really great. Um, and then you you have options to say view it uh, in an individual view, view all of the actions, all of the actions. Um, and um, there there's something here that... Uh, actually somebody was talking about in the chat room earlier, which is spam mails. Whenever you get spam mails and there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom, um, clicking that is usually a bad idea because it tells people that you read the message and it's actually an active email address. And so guess what? If, you're, if your email address is being sold around, it's going to keep being sold. And so you can actually in Airmail create custom actions. Um, and custom actions are great because I have so many of these here. But there's ultimate spam. And I originally uh, had, I, I need to update this one, um, an unsubscribe action in there. And instead, I'm just going to delete that. And now it bounces it and it marks it as spam. So for people who aren't familiar with bouncing an email, basically what it does is it returns it back to the original email that sent it and said, hey, this was not deliverable. We can deliver it. Um, which, you know, can be quite useful if you can do that because uh, hopefully you'll have turned off image loading um, for uh, unknown uh, domains. Um, but you can create all sorts of actions. Um, so say, for example, uh, I've got a receipt here, which was uh, sending it, send a workflow as an older action. There's now send shortcuts, but it still works. Um, it saves it as a web receipt, as a PDF, um, and that trashes the email. Done. Um, track, uh, so saving the mail and attachment saves both of them to iCloud. Track deliveries, uh, sends it over to deliveries, uh, runs a shortcut, uh, applies a couple of labels, and then archives the email. Um, there's so much that you can do here. And that's, you know, with just creating things. Obviously, you've got your different themes. Um, so you can have uh, day themes and night themes. If I turn off follow the system, um, then I can just go ahead and set that to a specific one. Um, and then say, for example, I would like a night theme then it's beautiful and dark. I will actually set that back to the day theme though, uh, because uh, otherwise people are gonna struggle to see what's on my screen, at least some of you will. Um, you can also set things as a default mail application, which is something I hope that we will cover uh, in a moment, uh, how to set those. Um, and of course, changing things like the app icon and so on. A lot of apps have this. Um, but for me, really, it is this humongous list of actions that I can do. So easily marking senders as VIPs, blocking people, adding and removing labels, uh, reply versus reply all. You can change your default there, creating a PDF forward an email as an attachment. I can't tell you how many times I've had to forward an email as an attachment because it was sent to my, my work email address, uh, but it was spam. And the way that we got stuff onto the mailing list was forwarding as an attachment. Doing that on a mobile device is really hard. Uh, but, you know, being able to do that here, um, you know, made it, made it much easier. Um, and you can turn on and off things like showing quotes. You can view the source of an email. So if you want to see all that raw HTML I and everything, love that feature. Then it's, it's right there. Uh, especially if something looks really janky and you're there going, wait, what? Oh, look, there's actually a plain text version. So I can go through and look at that. Oh, cool. New recipe app. Wonderful. I'll check that out later. Uh, but Airmail is the app that I use the vast majority of the time. Um, if you if you subscribe, then you get some extra options like sending later, tracking your email, um, and templates. Templates are great um, where you can insert and create templates. I don't have a setup on, on this iPad for this account, but it would allow you to say, for example, you regularly were inviting people to come and guest on your podcast. You could create a template for that. Um, or, um, and then, and then use that every time you want to, you can also have multiple email signatures so you can switch between your different email signatures with a tap. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that's airmail. I've given it a very high level overview. If you're really interested, 
dive into it um, and and have a good play because it is a really really powerful uh, application and uh, yeah it, it's it works for me. Yep, um, I, that bounce feature is, more than anything else is what uh, I like about airmail. When those uh, that unsubscribe doesn't seem to be working, or uh, for whatever reason they've not included that button in there, being able to hit that uh, bounce that tricks it into thinking that the email is no longer valid, so handy because uh, sometimes yep. they just don't quit. Um, yep. Rosemary mentioned uh, setting default apps. So I was going to, we'll show you how to do that really quickly. Uh, if you launch your settings app, you will scroll down until you find the email app that you want to make your default app. So in this case, uh, maybe it's airmail. I will tap on airmail here. And then I, uh, you can see down here at the bottom, it says default mail app. Right now I have Spark selected. Now it's important to understand that uh, app developers who are making these third-party mail apps will need to enable this feature, but it's uh, kind of a, it's one of those flip the switch kind of things. Um, so we will choose default mail app and you can see the four options. These are the mail apps I have on my device that are offering the ability to switch the default mail app. So I will, if I wanted to switch it to airmail, I would tap on airmail instead and then the system would know that's my default mail app. So then the next time I tap on an email address or another thing that would typically bring up uh, Spark as my means of sending an email, it would now choose airmail as the way to send the email. So it's a little weird that you kind of have to find one of the apps and do the default mail apps uh, setting there, but that is how you go about it. So again, launch the settings app, scroll down through the list of apps until you find the mail app you're wanting to use as your default. From there, down at the bottom, you'll see an option for default mail app, and then you just tap on the one that is yours. And as they say, bada bing, bada boom, you have your new default mail app ready. The system will know, and it can pop up that uh, compose field from the app that you're using as your mail app. All right. Tell us about uh, how we get rid of spam and nonsense in, that should be a, a musical, spam and nonsense. Uh, anyway, how we get rid of that in our email inbox. Yeah, so there used to be a service, or there still is actually, that a lot of people have used over time called umroll.me. Um, and the idea was it would bundle everything up and send you one email at the end of the day with a whole bunch of things in. And then it came out that they are, wait for it, selling your data. Um, and Umroll Me was one of those things I'd looked at before and I'd never really gotten around to doing. And once that happened, I just wasn't going to do it because, I mean, it's a free service and you have to be aware, of course, with free services, you are the product um, rather than, you know, what you think is the product. Um, but I was looking for something else and I found CleanFox. And CleanFox is something that is designed to help you go through all the emails in your inbox to get rid of stuff. Um, and I've set it up so that we've got the tutorial. So, uh, you know, you swipe uh, this way to, to delete stuff. Uh, to auto delete, you swipe up to delete and then you drag to the right to keep it. So um, then I can go through and hey, uh, Zoom video communications, do I want to auto delete this? Do I want to just straight up delete all of the emails from the sender or do I want to keep? Well, actually, I want to delete all the emails from this. Um, same with Matalan. It's um, so and, pretty. Uh, I know it's really cute. Um, I'm just going to get rid of the, uh, do I like clean Fox? Because I do. Oh, uh, and I think I've managed to crash it because apparently they didn't expect that to happen. I will have to file a bug report. Um, but it says my mailbox has been cleaned uh, because I, I process some newsletters and so on. And as you get more and more things, um, then it will do that. And the idea is it's trying to clean up your inbox and also, uh, you know, theoretically clean up the earth. They have a partner uh, which uh, wants uh, to, uh, or will plant a, a square meter of tree for every person you invite if you use their referral system, uh, which I, th I think uh, we can probably put a link to that as well in the show notes. So if people want to use that as an option, then they can. And uh, over in settings, you, you can see mailboxes. So you can add multiple mailboxes if you want to. Um, you can ch control notifications. So if you don't want this to notify you, you just want to pop in there every once in a while and use it to help clean stuff up, you can do that. Um, and of course, there's rating clean fox and so on. It's it's a really pretty cute little app. I mean, look at that tiny adorable fox. Mm -hmm. So cute. Um, and, um, you know, there's not a lot to it. But at the same time, there is, um, because it does so much. Um, you can change between a list and, and a, a tab view. And you can also see um, a history. So if you set things to auto-delete, 
um, then you can you can see them under automatically deleted. Um, similarly with kept, you can see the, the kept ones there, which is great. Um, I, I really appreciate it. It's a free app, um, which it makes it even better, um, but it's really helpful for getting on top of, you know, potentially hundreds of emails in your inbox. Yes. Um, it, I was reading through the privacy policy here uh, in, in just so that the folks are aware. And this is yeah. this is good. This is interesting. In return for this free service, the transactional data extracted from the user mailboxes allow us to establish statistical studies marketed with very yeah, yeah, marketed with various economic operators, companies, associations, schools and universities to improve their products and services and refine their knowledge of the markets. We guarantee you in this respect that we do not communicate any data for advertising, targeting purposes, profiling or re-identification. The tools we use are proven and do not allow your subsequent identification in any way to perform statistical uh and anal- wait to perform analyses. yeah but shouldn't it be an s I, it, it's spelled incorrectly yes okay I think, good i think i think it's a typo thank you to perform statistical analyses uh and the production of our reports we must carry out some processing of its users personal data we therefore act as a data controller in that we determine the means and purposes of the processing of your data uh so you can read through here to learn more about it um but what they're saying is that they are uh, they are making sure that there's not re-identification uh, ability for these different things, meaning that this data is not per is not personally tied to you. Um, so I was curious. Providing a, a free service for email always makes me a little sketched out, and I always like to know kind of what's going on there. So you can read through the whole. Um, privacy policy to learn more about it. Uh, but it is good to get that kind of initial thing that it's not an advertising handover, but instead is about, uh, it sounds like helping different newsletters and other uh, services like that figure out um, how often people are unsubscribing and, and uh, getting rid of the emails from them. All right. Uh, and then you've got another one here that I uh, have heard a lot about, but have not uh, used myself. And that is Unibox. Yeah. So email traditionally is chronological. The email that you received most recently at the top, the email you received least recently at the bottom, unless you manage to accidentally hit that arrow in Outlook and lose all of your emails, uh, in which case tap the arrow again, and it'll resort them. But Unibox takes a different approach. Unibox says, hey, let's base this com- uh, we'll combine it with time because time is useful, but let's base this on sender. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, Sean Blanc because Sean has sent me quite a few emails, as you can see. And look, as I go through, I can see all the different emails that he sent me um, and I can go, well, I have read all these and they were wonderful. And now I can actually go ahead and I can use a menu and I can show his contact details or if I swipe the other way, I've got trash and then I've got spam if I swipe further. And again, these are customizable. So if I want to get rid of all of the emails from this person or company, then I can do that and I swipe and then you tap to confirm the action and then it gets rid of them. Um, And this I find to be really useful because it will allow me to actually fairly quickly blitz through my inbox um, and go, okay, so Zoom, I'm going to trash. There's a different Zoom here. So they must have used two different email addresses. Um, And so that's that's why they're there twice. Um, But it's a very fast way. If you know all of those emails from Cotton Bureau, you've never actually bought anything from there, even though you quite like the look of it, then you can just delete all of them (laughs) and done. Yeah. Or you can go through your inbox with, you know, maybe another application that's more, more suited to this and cherry pick those few uh, emails that are really important that you want to keep and then come back in here and go, okay, blitzing. Okay, I don't care about emails from Slack anymore. Delete. Uh, MailChimp, what the heck? I don't need MailChimp emails. Apple beta software, well, they've sent me like 10 emails so I need to get on the beta now. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's it's got tips and everything set up as well. Um, it does, so it's a free app to download. Um, i and uh, I have now forgotten, I believe it was a fairly low price one time in app purchase to add multiple accounts to this. Um, I'm just going to double check exactly what that was. $8.99 to set up Airma- uh, Unibox Pro. Um, and that is a one time purchase, uh, which allows you to add as many accounts as you like um, and so on. It can also do things like automatically marking things as red, syncing over a specific period of time and you can toggle off those those hints and tips if you don't like them um but if you've got a lot of email and you know honestly the vast majority of things from this person i want to keep 
then you can archive all of those. Um, and it will allow you to get the number of emails in your inbox down to the point where you can go through and manually sort out the last few. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is a philosophy type thing. If you don't care about having zero emails in your inbox, that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to get on your case about that. If you find having loads of email in your inbox stresses you out and it means that you don't really know what you need to do anymore and, and so on and so forth, then uh, and, and maybe you've let it get a bit out of hand. I know a lot of us have let some things go over the last year. <laughs> um, then, uh, then you know, this is a way of helping you get back on top of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's Unibox. Nice. All right. Up next, we've got Rosemary Orchard showing us a product we've heard about for quite a while that's finally here. All right, Rosemary, <laughs> tell us about uh, the Chipola One, which you have your hands on. Uh, well, the irony of this, Micah, is I did have my hands on it about two minutes ago and I somehow put it somewhere on my desk where I can't see it. Fortunately, in preparation for the show, I actually already set this up in Find My. So if you just give me one moment here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make it ring. Now, the good news with the Chipola One Spot, uh, from what I can tell, is it's much louder than the AirTag. Oh, interesting. Um, and of course, it's not playing a sound for me, is it? Where did... Oh. Oh. Ah, okay. I couldn't see it for looking. It was standing up. There we go. I will stop playing the sound. Okay, so the Chipola One Spot, uh, it's upside down. There we go. Uh, it came comes in this lovely uh, cardboard sleeve. Uh, it's got beautiful colors on it. You slide it out and then you slide it up again. I'm not quite sure why there are two slides here. Um, but then you've got a Chipola One Spot. Now, I did set this up in advance of the show because I didn't want everybody seeing all of my personal information. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty good. I'm pleased. You know, it was inside the packaging and I was able to clearly hear it. Um, and compared to an AirTag, so this is an AirTag in the Belkin holder, the Apple cell, it is like, it's it's the same diameter. It is actually a little bit slimmer uh, because it doesn't have to come out, you know, and do that extra width. It's about the same thickness as an AirTag. And of course, unlike an AirTag, it's got a hole in it. Um, so these are quieter, which is a good thing. Um, and to set it up in um, the Find My app, uh, you just have to go ahead and in Find My tap plus to add a device. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the Chipolo uh, it boxes say, of course, um, that you need to activate the Chipolo, which you do by pressing on the logo. So if you press the logo, then that activates it so that it can look it up. Um, and uh, just go do that. And sorry, I just need to zoom out a little bit in Find My so that I can do this correctly. So if you pop over into the item section and then tap on the plus, Fortunately, it's not zoomed in too far. Then I can choose to add an air tag, or I can add another item. And then, if I were to press the 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 uh, button on this to set it up, then it would go ahead and find it, which is great. I am really pleased with this. I have got this to actually chuck in a suitcase, um, and because it's so loud, I don't need to worry about it being really quiet even inside a bag. Um, and so I'm very pleased with it. I don't know and I need to find out. And so my parents are going to be hopefully willing guinea pigs for this. If they're not willing, then I guess I'm going to find out later um, <laughs> where I'm going to leave this at their house uh, for a week or a couple of days. I'll probably go pick it up if it starts beeping and annoying them. Um, but I will check to make sure uh, that this works the same way the air tags do. They've already been a guinea pig to an air tag um, test uh, of me leaving at their house. And then, of course, it started beeping and let them know uh, that there was an air tag there. They knew I left it on the coffee table in plain sight with a post-it note saying, when this starts beeping, call me. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, I love my parents. I did not want them to want to kill me. Um, so uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to stay on their good side. But the, the Chipolo is going to go through the same test. But I have to say, you know, these are much cheaper than the air tag. But they are, you know, plastic. Like, this is not the kind of material where I'm going to care about it getting beat up, whereas right. the, the AirTag is quite pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let's face it. The case is Apple Cell suck at protecting the AirTag. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they, they're designed for holding the AirTag onto something rather than protecting the AirTag. Um, and, of course, um, you know, even if you get a lovely, say, Waterfield case, they've had to perforate the top of it, because the speaker is on the white side of the air tag, the battery is on the silver side. That's how you replace the battery in there. Um, uh, so they've had to perforate the top so it can still get damaged. Whereas this is definitely louder. Uh, I checked uh, the the range posted online, and it it is louder, which is I think a good thing. Uh, and it comes in a variety of colors as well. I was boring. I got black. Um, so one of these is twenty five dollars really versus the twenty nine 
for uh, one AirTag and four of them is $75, which is cheaper than the, the $100 for Apple's uh, four packs. So, uh, you know, and then you can get six for $105. So if you want to give people these as presents <laughs> or attach them to your cat who looks very slightly alarmed. Yeah, by that, at that, that gigantic that cat does not tag look happy. on that poor little um, cat's neck. My God. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my cat, when I was fostering her, would really have not appreciated that. Um, but they do come in green. And I know, Mike, how much yeah, you love green. I was so. definitely eyeballing that green one for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can replace the battery. I have not yet managed to open this to find out how. Uh, I can try right now live on air. Uh, but I'm feeling like I'm not going to get anywhere because I'm I'm using a twist motion. And I have not read the instruction manual. <laughs> so I don't know how to get into this. So, uh, yeah, but replaces you can replace the battery to your battery, same battery life, as the that's AirTag. good um and then yeah. also it is water resistant ipx5 so i imagine that it is kind of difficult to get open uh as yeah. that makes sure that uh splashes of water do not damage the tag uh yeah. there's the green one um i really so i've been using uh apple's air tags and um on, on a few occasions where I was out and about um, having that notification saying, hey, you left this one behind. Uh, mm -hmm. It was nothing that I wasn't aware of, but it was just, it was kind of a, a relief to have that notification, uh, not only letting me know that it's working, but also for the sake of uh, knowing if I ever did need to be notified that I would be and would be able to go back and find whatever it was that was missing. So um, I'm really digging AirTags themselves and glad that other parties are making uh, devices that work on Apple's Find My Network. Um, and excuse me, Chipola was definitely one of those ones that uh, was among the first to say that they would be you know, joining Apple's Find My Network in a big way. And it looks like the integration is really well done. Um, it looks like it's pretty uh, well thought out and actually works as it's supposed to. Uh, and as you would expect. Now, does this, do the Chipola One um, tags allow for the precise finding that you get with air tags? Um, where yes. it point with the so, arrows and everything? Uh, so if I go to... Uh, da, 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 da. no, uh, brains, words, uh, no. So it doesn't have the same precise finding, or at least it doesn't appear to if I, wait, I'm, yes. So if I went for my AirPods Pro, which are also here on my desk, mm -hmm. if I look at the find here, it mm -hmm. says it's nearby. Okay. And so if I do the find, then it's, it's somewhere and it's, it's right there. Yeah. Um, if I scroll down to suitcase, which is what I, I named this Chipolo, then you can uh, see the directions save with you. Yeah. Which it is. And then if I hit directions, it pops me over to maps. Darn, I was so hoping that it had a that I thought is, it had a U1, so I guess it doesn't. Yeah, I thought it did as well. And I'm Weird. not quite sure what is going on there. Uh, which is a shame. But as as we discovered when I stood up the packaging on my desk instead of lying it down, it is loud and so you can hear it. And I, I'm I'm impressed with that. Um it does make a slightly different sound. I'll hold it up to the microphone and see if we can hear it. Wow, yeah. Yeah, it is loud, um, but it works. It's obnoxious enough that nobody is going to ignore that. If you do that in a shopping mall or something, they're going to come. They're going to go, what is this thing? And why is it making that sound? Rather than, well, oh, that's interesting. I'm wandering off. Um, so, or, I mean, they might leave, I suppose, if it's particularly loud. Um, but uh, yeah. Yep. That's, I think they've... Um they went with that 120 decibel sound as kind of the trade-off yeah. for not having the uh, U1 built in. For some reason, I thought they did, but I guess uh, that's not yeah, the case. Yeah, I thought they did as well. Which, you know, if 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 you if you're if you're like me and you tend to dump out your handbag onto your sofa or your couch, um, and then stuff doesn't always make it back in there, being able to precisely pinpoint under which of the eight bajillion cushions I have on there because <laughs> I, I I collect cushions, it's comfortable, um, is is quite useful. Um, but uh, if if you can just locate it by sound, then that works as well. I mean, when I was looking for my iPad earlier, guess what? It was under one of the eight bajillion cushions. Um, I I was I just made it play a sound and it worked perfectly. Um, so you know, I think I think there's some trade offs. Uh, the fact that it's part of the Find My Network though is great. Uh, I really really like that because it means that all the things are in one app and there is no subscription for you know finding the stuff. You pay the price of the device and that's it. You're in. 
Yes. So now it makes sense that the uh, AirTag is a little bit more expensive. You're paying for that U1 uh, chip, which gives you the uh, precision finding uh, opportunity. All right, folks, I have checked the clock and the spreadsheet, and it looks like it's time to talk about the news. And I'm really excited about this first uh, story that we have for you today. Uh, Rosemary Orchard and I happen to be uh, hosts on the Relay FM network. I, for a podcast called Clockwise, and Rosemary automators is there i can't remember are you on others as well or is it just, i'm on other on? podcasts but they're not hosted on relay gotcha so yes I, I share the love around i'm on twit i'm on relay i'm independent as well you know do all the things yes rosemary is prolific uh but given that we are both there and also because this is just a really cool thing uh every year relay fm does a um a fundraiser for saint jude uh to honor uh, like Relay's own uh, birthday, but also uh, to give back to St. Jude. Um, it's not my story to tell, but you can go to uh, Relay's blog to learn more about it and why uh, Relay works so hard every year to uh, help with St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. Um, but just so you know, uh, on Friday, September 17th, there's going to be this huge podcast-a-thon um, I will be participating in some of the fun that's taking place by way of a, and I think Rosemary, you are too, by way of a game yeah. show. Um, yep, yep. So that should be fun. But also, uh, it's an opportunity to donate to uh, help them raise money for, for St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, which uh, if you don't know about St. Jude, what's super cool is that it is a hospital for children where if you have a child who needs help, um, with you know the, the different things that they cover, uh, the parents don't have to worry about paying for those things. And so, mm -hmm. uh, especially here in the United States with our incredibly terrible uh, health system, um, these kinds of places are, they're miracle workers and uh, help folks in need uh, all the time. So yeah, it's uh, well worth checking out. But again, um, we'll include a link in the show notes, uh, but it's uh, really cool, and uh, you can be a part of the fun and a part of uh, helping out St. Jude uh, by donating there. Yeah, yeah, it is a great cause, and I'm really glad that I get to a little bit support it, and uh, hopefully some of you will be able to do so as well if that is possible for you. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really glad. And uh, Micah, I don't think I'm on your game show team, but uh, maybe, maybe we get to play some games together uh, on iOS Today at the same time. Um, so, uh, let's, let's see what we can do there. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, there's some other news as well. Okay. Apple did a U-turn. Uh, so Apple announced on the 16th of August that they were bringing back some in-person today at Apple classes on the 17th of August. They're not going to do it. It was going to come back on, um, uh, August 30th. It's no longer coming back on August 30th. I have a feeling this ties in with Apple pushing back, uh, people having to be in the office until January. Um, because, uh, well, this Delta variant of uh, COVID is causing problems, unsurprisingly. Um, and, uh, yeah, there, there is, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they uh, seem to not quite be certain what they're doing. I think someone somewhere made a decision um, <laughs> and then realized very quickly, oh, wait, that's that's not a great idea. Because they were taking reservations for these classes at some store locations, but all of them are now gone. And Apple's back to offering virtual sessions, which I've heard from several people working for Apple in retail that they're doing from home. Um, and some of these employees have got gorgeous homes. I am so impressed. I know, um, right? they're all doing an amazing job as well. Um, I know a lot of people working from home, having to switch really quickly. It's one thing if you, you've just, you know, if you're, you're a tech worker and you've got a laptop and whatever, so you do your stand up and it doesn't matter. There's a cat trying to climb on your shoulder. That's fine. But trying to do all of these classes like today at Apple and stuff like that from home and see everyone's devices and stuff. Wow. That, that is a humongous challenge. So congrats to all of them who are managing to do such a great job with that. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry that you don't get to do it more easily in person from August 30th, but that's probably a good thing right now, unfortunately. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, <clears throat> we've got more countries launching Apple Pay support. Uh, mm -hmm. A cutter and uh, it's, it could be Chile that comes next or Chile, depending yeah. on how you pronounce it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's uh, slowly but surely spreading to multiple countries. Uh, so I don't know, is that, an, is that Qatar's national bank that's uh, supporting it right off the top? Yeah, Qatar's national bank. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, so more will be adding support over time. Uh, but yeah, rejoice if you're in these places and you are looking to have uh, Apple Pay support there. Yeah, yeah, it's up to 60 places now, 60 countries. That's that's a good start. All right. Oh, and this one, this next one's a little bit of a bummer. So you may, yeah. uh, if you, you tuned in to watch us cover the, um, us being twit, cover uh, Apple's WWDC uh, conference and announcements, or if you uh, have kind of kept up with what we talked about with new features coming in iOS 15, you may have heard about SharePlay. SharePlay is a feature that allows for kind of collaboration um, between folks who are on FaceTime. So with FaceTime, certain apps and services would give you the ability to collaborate. So you could watch um, a show together on Apple TV Plus with family who live elsewhere. Uh, there are apps like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Whiteboard apps where uh, multiple people would be able to use the whiteboard app and be able to collaborate in that sense. And then audio listening where you could uh, all be streaming something from Apple Music or another supported platform and be able to hear the song as you uh we're, we're listening along. That feature um, is delayed. So originally scheduled to come out with the release of iOS 15, which is right around the corner um, as next month will likely bring us the introduction and announcement of new iPhones. And shortly after that, we see typically the introduction of the iOS and iPadOS, tvOS, et cetera, that was announced uh, back in at WWDC in June. Um, we're not going to get SharePlay right away. So they're still working on it, trying to iron out the issues that they've come up with, uh, that they've you know come across thus far. So um, yeah, just be aware that uh, if you were hoping SharePlay was among the first features that you would get to try, uh, sounds like that's not going to be the case, which for some people I know is a bummer because that is a great uh, COVID feature. And I know a lot of people were yeah. pumped to be able to do that um, from you know their their relative locations and be able to watch a show with a family member that lives elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a shame, but hopefully we'll have it in time for the uh, the Christmas and holiday season. So uh, for those people who are still not able to travel or you know whatever, then they will be able to use this then, which which is great. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate to live very close to my parents, but I know some people like you, Micah, live a very long way away from your families. Um, and so uh, being able to share things with them, whether or not you're going to be there on what you consider to be the important days is uh, wonderful. Yeah, um, I am looking forward to this feature finally shipping because I would like to use this and watch some shows with my fam. Um, all right. Uh, up next, we've got T can you tell me a little bit about what's going on with Corellium and Apple? Uh, we know, so Corellium is a company that essentially virtualizes um, your iOS uh, app, or not iOS app, but excuse me, the iOS operating system, which is a little bit uh, <laughs> redundant, but um, it, it takes what you have on your phone and gives you a virtual version so that security researchers can test different things and see uh, what kind of bugs there are and what kind of issues there might be with uh, iOS, iPadOS, et cetera. Um, Apple and Corellium have kind of gone back and forth and back and forth, and now there's an appeal in a lawsuit, and so it's kind of messy, but what, what's uh, what's going on in this latest uh, bit of news from, from Apple? And yeah, so Apple originally lost their copyright claim against them because basically Apple said, you know, they are duplicating every single thing we've done, um, and therefore that's a breach of copyright. So same thing if I went out and copied a best-selling author's novel word for word and stuck it up with a different name on it, or even the same name and just said, hey, this isn't the name of security that I'm doing this. They're saying that that breached copyright. Uh, a Florida judge disagreed um, with that, but now Apple is officially appealing that case. Um, uh, so that was in December that uh, that judge uh, said um, that Apple didn't have a case there, um, and now uh, Apple are, have filed, um, you know, have filed an appeal. So that's eight months later, um, but um, they are they're they're saying that you know this this really is. Um, a case of it, and they are filing a very specific copyright lawsuit, which is, uh, so Apple also reached a settlement with Corellium earlier this month. It's a bit complicated. There's a lot of background reading here, um, but that was a federal lawsuit that would have gone to trial based on um, some other claims. Um, but I think the thing that is the problem here is Corellium is selling iOS as well. 
Uh, it's not just that they've taken it and copied it. They're actually selling it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Apple gives iOS away for free if you buy a device or have right. a device that can run it. Um, so selling it is kind of, yeah. Wrong. Yeah, it's it's messy. I think, uh, you know, of course, security researchers and advocates are saying we need this and it's important. And I, I see that side of the argument. Uh, but then I also see how Apple is saying, well, you are making money off of a thing that we created um, as opposed to making money off of a thing that you created. And so that is kind of troublesome. So I get the uh, argument in terms of uh, the, the sort of business side of things. And I get the argument in terms of the security side side of things and why there's um, disagreement there. It's uh, it's a tough, tough call. So I don't envy any judge who has to decide how this uh, all works out. Um, let's talk about this next one. Uh, folks, if you out there have uh, had trouble getting the latest episode of one of our podcasts or one of any podcasts that you download on uh, Apple Podcasts, you're not alone. Um, there's a whole mess of stuff that's going on over at Apple Podcasts because of its uh, recently launched subscription service that has caused issues for different podcasts and the feeds um, that have resulted in uh, podcasts not being downloaded when they would expect uh, when one would expect them to be downloaded and just all sorts of things have been all sorts of issues. Uh, so Six Colors linked to um, a, a piece talking about uh, this from The Verge where um, Ashley Carmen uh, kind of detailed the different uh, issues that have uh, resulted. In fact, the article is entitled Apple's attempt at podcast subscriptions is off to a messy start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I have had so many emails from people saying, hey, I don't get the latest episodes of your podcast anymore. What's up? Or is there a shortcut to fix this? No, there isn't. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Um, Apple's podcast app has always been slower than other apps to, to get podcast episodes. They seem to pull feeds sporadically. If you use the different apps, say, for example, Overcast, which is really good for, for audio-only podcasts, um, then that can show you how often a podcast updates. So it'll say, hey, this comes out uh, every two weeks on a Tuesday afternoon. And it knows that it comes out every two weeks on a Tuesday afternoon. So guess what it does every two weeks on a Tuesday afternoon? Yoink, it goes and it pulls all the stuff. Um, obviously, Tuesday afternoons are Tuesday afternoons for me. They would be Tuesday mornings for Micah. Um, but, you know, it, it knows approximately when this stuff happens. And so it goes and it looks for it more frequently than it'll still scan the rest of the time. But Apple's podcast app has always been slower to get stuff um, than, than everything, than all the other apps. And now it just seems to be totally and utterly broken. Like, it'll get things this week and then not for three weeks. Uh, it's a little bit worrying. But, yeah, they, they are... Apple is throwing money at this. Um, so um, they they do have an affiliate program. They famously killed it for iOS apps, which broke a lot of the way that a lot of websites worked. Uh, there were a lot of app review websites out there that disappeared almost immediately after this, uh, especially because they did it on really short notice. But the affiliate program itself still exists and you can use it for books um, and so on. Um, and they are paying a 100% commission um, on these thing uh, on podcast subscriptions right now because they want people to subscribe <laughs> to the podcast but that doesn't work if people can't actually listen to the content so i'm not quite sure what's going to go on here i'm really hoping there's some people at apple beavering away really hard i mean i know there always are people working really hard at apple um you know the employees are great but it is uh yeah it's, it's a complete and utter mess right now absolutely um i we have to there's actually more work that uh, we have to do here at Twit to make sure that yeah. our podcasts are getting where they need to be. So we have to check that all the time. So it would be great if they could fix it. Um, hint, hint. Uh, let's talk about, I'm really pumped about this. Uh, if you watch Smart Tech Today or you've heard me ever talk about smart home stuff, you know how bullish I am about Thread. Uh, we had the uh, lead technology, head of technology, um, uh, Jonathan Huey on Smart Tech Today before, uh, who like was 
instrumental in the creation and uh, ongoing work of Thread uh, and love talking to him about it. Um, Nanoleaf is one of the first uh, companies of a few that offer what's called HomeKit over Thread support, meaning that they are HomeKit enabled devices that work with Apple's HomeKit framework uh, for the smart home that are uh, be being communicated with through the use of Thread. And so it goes by way of, uh, in many cases, your HomePod mini or your Apple TV, if you've got the most recent one that has a Thread, that has Thread border router support in uh, built into it. And um, Thread is an incredibly, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Responsive and also a self-healing network. If I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of, of Thread. You can go back and watch that episode of Smart Tech Today to learn about why I think Thread is so incredible. Um, but uh, Nanoleaf makes some of the some products that are available uh, that use Thread, and they've recently issued an update after some time of uh, of sort of refining things and fixing things that lets you use your certain devices that you have as thread border routers themselves. So I will explain uh, what a border router is um, so that you understand kind of what happens here. So in a thread network, you have a bunch of different devices and some of them can be kind of nodes on the network. Some of them can be uh, routers on the network and some of them can be border routers. Now, uh, it's important to understand that a border router you can kind of think of as a bridge. So you may be used to a Philips Hue, for example, where you plug in that little rounded rectangle and what it does is it connects to your router and it lets you talk to the devices on your network that are that are Hue devices by you uh, on your phone launching the Hue app. You hit the button to turn on or off a uh, uh, a light that sends a message to your route through your router, which then goes to the bridge. And then from the bridge, it communicates to that light and tells it, Hey, turn on or turn off. And then reports back that the light has been turned on or turned off. That happens, you know, instantly, um, with the thread network, there has to be a way for the thread devices, which exist in their own little world to be able to translate and communicate with uh, different devices that are on your Wi-Fi network, especially the ones that are telling them what to do. That is where the border router comes into play. It is the device responsible for adding things to your network and then being able to be the translator between uh, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and what is on the thread network. So you, that's why you have to have a border router of some sort in your home in order to actually use a thread network. You can't just have um, a thread-enabled device that isn't a border router uh, because that's what handles the provisioning. So with Nanoleaf adding thread border router support to uh, certain products, including its Shapes line and its new Elements line, line, um, folks who have those devices who maybe don't have a HomePod mini or an Apple TV or another device that supports, uh, that, that adds thread border router support, you will be able to use this. Um, now these can also just exist and act as thread devices on your network, meaning they don't have to be the border router, especially if you already have one. So in my case, my HomePod mini is the thread border router. It is the device responsible for adding new thread devices to my network. From there, the different devices that are on your thread network, depending on what they are, can act as kind of parent nodes that can communicate with a bunch of different things and uh, individual nodes themselves. Those are typically battery powered devices. They call them sleepy, meaning that they check in uh, when the their purpose is uh, activated. So for example, a, a door or window contact sensor, it'll check in automatically whenever you open or close the door and it senses that, but it will also check in every once in like 5,000 milliseconds, I think is, is the, the standard thing, just to kind of see where it is and report to the network where it is. Um, so by adding the support, it just makes the network even more robust. Um, interestingly, Nanoleaf has also said that they worked closely with Eero, um, which Eero for the longest time has said that they have uh, thread support and, it, and have thread radios built into its um, routers. They worked closely with Eero to have... Um, integration with the thread radios that are built into those routers. 
I have not seen it in practice. I have updated my firmware. I've updated my network. I have done a whole bunch of little tricks and stuff to try and get that working to see how it works. And there are just not a lot of detail right now. I've um, reached out to the companies to try to get some more clarification on what's going on there. Uh, but ultimately, um, for most folks, what they need to know here is uh, by updating the firmware for these devices, you are uh, more likely, if you don't have a device already, you will be able to take advantage of having uh, a thread network and the benefits that come with that. Um, it is one of one of the only uh, home smart home protocols out there that gets better the more devices you get. Uh, most protocols they start to sort of overlap with one another and communicate across one another and create crosstalk, which kind of uh, brings some latency to the network. But Thread is purpose-built to make for a more robust and self-healing network the more devices you add. And that's one of the brilliant things about Thread uh, that sets it apart and why I'm so bullish about it. And uh, I've been incredibly impressed with the uh, latency of Thread thus far. So yeah, I uh, definitely did a little celebration dance when I saw that uh, Nanoleaf was updating its system to add more Thread support. And I'll be keeping an eye on that as um, as I see how it works with Eero. And then we'll probably report back on Smart Tech today. Oh, Rosemary's yeah. got something pulled up here. Yeah, yeah. So I just pulled mine up because I have the original Nanoleaf. So unfortunately, they won't be getting thread support. But I've had a lot of people ask questions about Nanoleaf. I stuck mine up in a frame, as you can see here. Um, and uh, yesterday, I added the uh, sync mode so it can play in time of the music. So that's playing in time of Dancing Queen uh, from ABBA. Um, and uh, it, it's so good. And it's really bright. It's like having a personal club in your house, which let's just say uh, in these times, having that on New Year's Eve was amazing. I really <laughs> appreciated that that's Popped funny we did that too at home party we yeah, yeah that, was, that was on new year's eve i was uh happy to have i've got the canvas in my living room and you know it mm -hmm. synced it with music that was playing and uh it made yeah. it a lot of fun all right let's yeah. talk yeah, about this they are great devices and they're really bright too yes they that's the the luminance output is uh pretty incredible um this next one is interesting. I just saw this story hit this morning. Um, Apple has launched a new study app. It's called Siri Speech Study. Uh, interestingly, it is invite only. So you have to get an invite mm -hmm. from Apple. But uh, if should you get an invite, um, it is all for improving uh, Siri the, the voice assistant. So uh, this app is, um, it's hard to find, first of all. I went to the app store and looked at uh, Apple's developer page trying to find it and couldn't find it. But if you do get it and you download it, you don't get anywhere um, because you have to type in a participant ID in order to take advantage of it. Um, but in theory, this is for folks who want to volunteer turning, in Siri theory, uh, who want to turn over more data for the sake of improving upon Siri. Uh, so I, I say huzzah to improvements to Siri because as it stands, not a big fan of old Siri, let me tell you. Um, I'm curious what you think. As, would this be something, if you got an invite to it, would you, uh, would you participate, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my life is a beta. I, all of my <laughs> stuff is running. Beta we operating really systems. have to get you a shirt. We really do. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we need a shirt for that. Uh, and on the back, it should say something like, go away or I'll turn you into a shortcut. <laughs> um, if you're being very annoying or something like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would love to take part in this. It's the sort of thing that I would very happily do. Um, it's quite possible that if Apple are being selective about who they invite, that, you know, I wouldn't be invited because I talk about this stuff as well. Um, and it depends on how closely they want to play their cards. But uh, this is this is pretty interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hope uh, that maybe I get an invite as well. I do use Siri a lot. I find it's pretty good. There's a number of times recently that I've asked it to set a timer and it doesn't do it. <laughs> it says, I'm having trouble. Why are you having trouble, trouble with the timer? With a timer? Come on. Yeah. It's not even like I've asked you to do something complex, like name it. Um, what was it? Check chips. Yeah. So I, I had a timer the other day for check chips because I, I was baking some 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 chips in the oven, uh, chips being uh, fries for the Americans. Um, and uh, it, when it went off, it showed me that my Chris timer was done. Chris, instead of check chips. What I have no idea. World? That is I weird. have no idea how that happened. That is so weird. 
I mean, I'm blaming my braces a little bit because I have a little bit of an extra lisp, which if you listen closely, you might hear. Um, but my, my pronunciation is not that bad. Right. You're going, um, I don't know how you got that. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's talk about this next one, this last one, actually. Um, I love when Apple releases these little uh, classes. Uh, so this is a session. It's a Today at Apple session. And this is about um, shooting portraits on iPhone. Uh, so this is a Today at Apple session that is all about that. Uh, what's nice is that it's uh, been released on YouTube. So I... I went to one of these sessions at one point that was uh, done via WebEx, um, and I had to tune in late because I was doing a podcast at the time, so I didn't really get a whole lot of information from it, but it was it's cool to see this one on YouTube uh, because then it means that I can check it out at any time, and you would get to actually learn the tips and tricks there. So I like what I like about this is that it really, I don't know, there was something, there's something about it where I go, oh, I can feel comfortable just taking a bunch of photos and seeing uh, how they, you know, how they turn out. It doesn't have to be that you kind of get one shot and stop there. Um, it, it sort of gave me permission a little bit to feel uh, empowered to take uh, as many photos as I needed to get the the right photo on an iPhone. I, I already feel like I can hold down the shutter button on a, you know, a DSLR or something. But here it was kind of nice to see a professional photographer just keep hitting that shutter button and find the one that works. Yep. Yep. That's, that's really great. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of these on YouTube as well. I feel like Apple already does have some great videos up there, but adding a few more wouldn't hurt. Agreed. All righty, folks. Up next, we've got Shortcuts Corner. And now it's time for Shortcuts Corner. Oh, wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Folks, I got a sneak preview. For folks who are listening, you didn't get to see the incredible introduction, uh, the incredible introduction animation that Anthony made. I got to get a preview of it the other day, and uh, he has finished it, and it looks amazing, and I'm so pleased and pumped uh, with that. So if you're listening, you need to tune in because you got to check that out. But this is Shortcuts Corner. This is the part of the show where folks write in with their shortcuts requests and questions, and Rosemary Orchard, the shortcuts expert, uh provides uh, a response and in many cases a solution. So mm -hmm. uh, Mike from Australia writes in to Rosemary to say, first of all, to the both of us, thanks for a great show. I'm enjoying it every week. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, Mike says, I have a very simple task I would like to solve with shortcuts, but I didn't find a way to do that. I would like to be notified when the outside temperature is rising above and falling below a certain temperature. Would that be possible using the pre-installed weather app and shortcuts? Well, Mike, let's see what Rosemary has to say about this. Well, so I, everything was going fine until Mike said using the pre-installed weather app, because that that is the, the fly in the ointment, the spanner in the works, so to speak, because... If you are doing this uh, through home and you 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 have, say, a temperature sensor outside in your home, you've got a weather station set up. I know I have one. Uh, I'm just popping it open on uh, my uh, phone. That's the wrong option. Let's switch to... There, there we go. I can show you this. Uh, so I have a, a storage cupboard and I've got a temperature sensor in there. As you can see at the moment, it's 23 and a half degrees and it's 65% humidity in there. And if I tap on that, it's got some grouped information as well. Um, but, um, you know, this is really useful in many ways uh, because I can actually go ahead and I can use this to uh, create uh, automations if I want to. Now you can't actually create automations directly inside the home app for temperatures. You need to use something like Home Plus or the Eve Energy app to do that. But Mike specifically wants to do this with the built-in shortcuts and weather. So I'm gonna do this live on air because the thing is, is if I look at the weather options, um, I can, you know, I can get the, the current weather um, and then I can get the details of the weather condition. Um, there we go. So I've got, instead of getting the date, I can get the temperature. And then I can see, then I can have a look at it if it's above something or below something. And Mike wants to know when it changes. So I think, Mike, what you're going to need to do here is you're going to need to use something like data jar. You're going to have to build a whole setup here, which gets the temperature, saves it to data jar with the current date and time. 
um, and then um, and then you know when it uh, and then gets the last one before that and compares it. So if you add it to a list, then uh, using data jar, I'll just pop over to apps. It's taking a moment to load. Let's just open data jar this way. Um, then you can uh, you can get the the value of something. So say for example, you had outside weather. You could then get the the first item from that, um, and then you could do a comparison. But the problem here is going to be doing something like uh, sending you a notification then, because what you need to do is inside of automations is you're going to need to create automations and you're probably going to want to do time of day. You might want to do uh, when you open an app, for example, if there's apps that you open frequently, um, then you you can do that. Um, so, um, you know, you're going to probably want to set up a lot of automations to do this, which is going to be complicated. So my suggestion is actually probably buy a weather station to stick it outside mm -hmm. and what a smart one that's got an app and use that app to notify you when it goes up, up above and below the temperatures, because you can absolutely do what you want to do with shortcuts, but it's going to be very complicated and it's going to take a lot of time for you to set up. Um, I personally have a NetAtma weather station. I don't know if those are available in Austria, uh, in Australia. Sorry, I know they're available in Austria because I bought my first one while I was living in Austria, um, but there are no kangaroos there, just a couple of dingoes. Um, maybe a wallaby. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, down in the land down under, you, you you will have a variety of smart options. Double check the Apple store, see if they've got something. Yeah, um, and then check your local retailers. I know Amazon's not so great down in Australia, um, but I know that you also have lots of great local retailers. Um, so, uh, which, which sells stuff. Um, so hopefully you will uh, find uh, a smart weather station that can do what you want here. Yep. Um that when you started to kind of describe the the process that you yeah. have to take to get that going um sometimes yeah. it's, sometimes yeah. the simplest of ideas do require some ridiculous work and then sometimes it's the opposite you think it requires some ridiculous work and it's actually just a few steps so it's unfortunate that that one is complicated but also mike you should feel good knowing that you, you know, in trying to figure that out for yourself, realize that it wasn't as complicated or that it was going to be more complicated than you thought. You were correct in, in thinking that. Uh, it, it, there's no kind of clean way of going about doing that uh, without purchasing some hardware. All right. Uh, Matt came in with the next uh, bit of Shortcuts Corner feedback. It says, I listen to your podcast, iOS Today. I'm in need of help with a tricky automation. I am a paid on-call firefighter for a small department in Michigan. We are alerted about calls for service on a pager system and via our smartphones through an app called Active Alert by Active 911. I'm already getting nervous. I don't even know if I want to, mm -hmm. if you want to give advice for somebody. <laughs> uh, I, I've got a suggestion. Okay, let me let me keep reading then. Uh, the app sends push notifications and sets off an alert on my phone. It will override silent and send as a priority alert, like an Amber Alert. I am wanting to be able to make that alert trigger my home kit accessories, such as lights, door, possibly set off an alarm through my home pods, etc. The active 911 can only be on one phone or device at a time and does not have shortcuts enabled in the app. What can be done, says Matt. Well, my first instinct here, Micah, because obviously this is complicated and you don't want to screw it up. So actually, I would personally try and leave the phone as out of this as possible uh, because you don't want to mess with that. You want that alert to come through at all costs. Um, and so my, my my next instinct was actually, let's go and have a look at the pager. Um, and I, I don't know what kind of pager um, Mike has got here, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, Matt has got, um, Mike was our previous question. Uh, but um, you might be able to do something with that. So, for example, if it vibrates um, and, you know, m moves around when it beeps, then you might be able to do something like stick an Akara vibration sensor to it um, and have that. And so I would suggest Velcro sticky dots. Velcro sticky dots are your friends when it comes to this kind of thing, because then you can pick it up and, and put it down when you want to actually take the pager with you out of the house. If, if you do that, maybe you just leave it at home all the time. Um, um, if you just leave it at home all the time and it's in one location, that's it's actually perfect for this. Um, and you can stick a vibration sensor to it. And the vibration sensor shows up in HomeKit as a motion sensor. And then you can say whenever motion is triggered on this thing, 
then, um, you know, then go ahead and light up the house um, and, and play some music through HomePods. You can't specifically play an alarm on a HomePod, but you can play an alarm sound with a home automation. Um, and I've just realized I'm holding the wrong device here. So I'm just going to pop that down um, and uh, pop up my iPhone. So in the automations, um, you, you'll see, for example, where a sensor detects something. And I actually have, if we scroll down a little bit here, um, I have uh, a chair. Um, and that is because, and I'm going to see if I can reach this. I don't think I can. I think I've stuck it in a very inaccessible spot. There we go. I have it. I managed to pull the battery out as well, so it hasn't even triggered. Uh, this is the Akar vibration sensor that I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the kind of size that it is, but then if you shake it around, that triggers the, the motion. Um, and hopefully, um, you might need to set the the uh, sensitivity higher uh, for that. But then when you can say when it detects motion, and you can say, for example, only if you're at home, uh, because if you're already out on call, then you, you don't want it lighting up your house for anybody else. Um, and then you can do things. So I would suggest you create a scene with everything you need. Um, but one of the things you can do is with your home pods, then you can say play audio. Um, and you can you can also pause audio, resume audio, etc. And you can also set a custom volume. Um, and then once you've done that, um, you, you'll be able to actually, you know, swipe up and, and control the volume uh, of it. Um, and then uh, you can also set to turn off. So it might turn off after two minutes or something. Uh, I would suggest probably not full volume. Uh, that That's going to be pretty, pretty loud. Um, and uh, it should be offering me the option to select the kind of audio here. I think I've just found another iOS 15 bug, uh, Micah, because it wants me to choose audio. Uh, and it's, if I tap done, it's good. Yeah. You have to choose audio for this automation to play. Well, I can't do that. So I'll just choose resume. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then it'll play music in the living room every time my chair wiggles, which probably not great for podcasting. <laughs> so I have to remember to delete that one after the show. But that is what I would do there. I would leave your iPhone out of the equation entirely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, iPhones and shortcuts are wonderful I would suggest that they are not perfect for this particular use case just because it is a bit tricky. There are almost certainly other things that you could do as well. Um, if you're willing to get your hands dirty and you're familiar with electronics, um, then uh, you could um, you could potentially solder um, something into the pager. Um, and there we go. My music is playing because my chair wiggled. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, I have a play pause button on my desk there, Micah. I will need to delete that in, in just a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, you could potentially connect something to the pager that's that's going to make it close the connection when, when it gets that buzz. Um, and then that would say close a fake door sensor, which, you know, would, would trigger something off or something. I don't know. Um, I don't know what kind of pager this is, but that is the place I would look at to do this. Excellent. All right. Um, that brings us to the end of Shortcuts Corner, which means it's time for some feedback. And I love this question. I'm really excited to answer it. Um, John writes in to say, OK, I have some weirdness going on with Apple Photos on iPhone and iPad. If I shoot just a pro raw photo, this doesn't happen with raw plus JPEG, and then edit it in Apple Photos, something weird happens. While I'm editing the photo, it looks fine. But the moment I hit done, parts of the image seem to light up as though there's a backlight. This happens no matter what edit I make. Even just cropping it very slightly causes this to happen. And uh, then John writes to say that the duck photo demonstrates the issue pretty well. So it's interesting. Uh, John had to take a photo of this in order to show the difference. Uh, this is the first one is before. Um, and then whenever, uh, oh wait, that might be after. No, okay, yeah. So the, the one go, before is before, and then the one that we're looking at second is after. And you can see parts of the photo have lit up. And uh, so John is going, what the heck is going on here? Uh, it looks as though something has made a rough selection around the duck and brightened it poorly. Now, the really weird thing is that this only happens when I display this image full screen. When you view the grid of images, it looks like the top one. Also, if you export the image, it looks like the top one. It only looks like the bottom one when you view it full screen on the iPad or the iPhone and only in Apple Photos. The reason I took these pictures of the iPad screen is because if you do a screen capture, it looks like the top one. Uh, John, very smart of you to take a photo to be able to see what's going on here. And I'm very happy to tell you what is happening. Um, so, a pro raw photo is a very special kind of photo that combines a whole bunch of different photos together to create an image 
that is what Apple sees as uh, kind of capturing as much of the photo as it possibly can. By that, I mean capturing as much of the scene as it possibly can. So it tries to go and grab the highlights of the sky, the shadows of the ground, and everything in between. Um, if, you are, if you've done any kind of photography, you know that a raw photo is a favorite of photographers because what happens is they, uh, the, the, the goal of a raw photo is to take in as much data as possible so that in the post edit, you can make adjustments with the more data you have. The idea is that you don't want to clip anything. You don't want uh, some of that data to be lost. And so if you were to uh, take a photo and make some of these adjustments and not use RAW, then sometimes the shadows are going to be blown out, meaning that they've gone kind of all the way to the max. And so some of that detail is lost. With Pro Raw, it kind of takes things a step farther by capturing even more data and also trying to present you with a photo that looks good. Now, here is why you're seeing this, and it's only happening on the iPad and the iPhone. This is because Apple's iPhone and iPad have HDR high dynamic range displays uh, and in some cases have um, the, the, the necessary brightness values as well, the contrast values as well. When the photo is untouched and it's in that big size, it's showing you the absolute of that, fo that photo. It's showing you like what that photo actually looks like with all of the data there. When you hit the edit button, the operating system is going, you're trying to make edits and you are trying to make an edit to the kind of uncollapsed version of that photo. You want to look at that, that uh, raw data and be able to see that. And so it drops away the changes that it's making as an exported pro raw. It's just showing you the raw version of the photo, not with everything kind of calculated and figured out, which is what pro raw is kind of trying to do. So when you hit that edit button, Again, it's taking away kind of the magic of the, the, the final Pro Raw and showing you what you would want to do to make adjustments to it. And the reason, too, why it's not showing it at that small size is because, again, at that small thumbnail size, you're not seeing what is the official kind of complete uh, compressed, ver and by compressed, I don't mean actually compressed down in size, but layered uh, photo that you get with uh, the Pro Raw format. So... It seems confusing at first, but that is also why you're not seeing it whenever you do a screenshot, because it is not showing you that final version that it's capable of displaying on your iPhone and your iPad. And that's why sometimes you'll get... Um, I, this this happens to me when I take photos at the beach. Uh, if I tap that edit button, then suddenly the highlights of the sky drop down and it looks more doled out. But when I hit that uh, done button, then it goes back to what that final photo looks like. The good news, uh, John, is that you can turn these features off. And so uh, I've included a link in the show notes to um, the iPhone user guide, which has uh, a, the ability to adjust HDR camera settings on the iPhone. So you can turn off automatic HDR and you can also keep the non-HDR version of a photo uh, if you want to make sure that you have both, uh, both kinds saved. And then you can turn HDR video off if you uh, have that problem with the video as well. Now, let's see. Um, I want to check out uh, what... Apple says about Pro Raw. Uh, so I've got another support document here, which we will link in the show notes, um, all about Apple's Pro Raw settings. So uh, I'm going to read this uh, little excerpt. Uh, Pro Raw combines the information of a standard Raw format along with Im iPhone image processing, which gives you more flexibility when editing the exposure, color, and white balance in your photo. With iOS 14.3 or later, your iPhone 12 Pro and iPhone 12 Pro Max can capture images in Pro Raw format using any of its cameras, including when also using the Smart HDR, Deep Fusion, or Night Mode features. You can edit Pro Raw photos in the Photos app and other third-party Photos apps. Uh, but it's being able to display those features very well in the Photos app, and that's why you're seeing that brightness kind of come through. Um, you can turn off Pro Raw as well if you'd like that to not be something that you use. But now that you kind of understand what you're seeing there, why that looks like the, the backlight is coming on, hopefully that helps you understand what's going on and why it goes away whenever you go through to edit a photo, why it doesn't look uh, like it does whenever you've kind of hit the done button. So all very interesting. Um, 
Uh, but I'm really glad that you asked that question because I had that happen to me before. I'm going, why, why, why is it looking different uh, what, before and after? So yeah, that's that. Um, I think that, that covers unless Rosemary, you have anything you want to add? No, no, I, I, I'm glad that you knew this because I had some weird theories about what might be going on as sort of bugs and so on, but uh, I'm really glad that you know the actual solution to that. So uh, yeah, thank you. No problem. All right, folks, it's time for App Caps. This is the part of the show where we put caps atop our head to honor our picks of the week. These may be apps or gadgets or other things we're pumped about, and we honor them with the caps. So we shall don our caps and celebrate, oh, <laughs> and celebrate our app caps. Yours almost looks like a napkin for my hat. <laughs> oh, that, you know what? We're going with that. This is a napkin turned into a hat for a hot dog. Um, I apologize for adjusting my camera to all the wonderful people behind the scenes, but sometimes you just have to get something this great fully in shot. <laughs> all right. Let us, uh, let's talk about our app caps and our app picks of the week. Rosemary, if you could describe the cap atop your head and your pick, that would be fantastic. Wonderful. The cap atop my head is an elasticated wonder full of foam. Uh, it is a hot dog with, oh yes, it's got mustard on it. Of course it does. The last time I wore this hat, Michael wore a mustard hat and it was amazing. Uh, and my app cap for today is going to require some difficult, let's put it that way, camera work for me because it's an Apple Watch app and it only exists on the Apple Watch. And so my, my app cap of the week is Ian's Awesome Counter. So I've got this set up here and I'm going to have to try and stick out a finger and uh, move my watch to, there we go, uh, to do things. So basically Ian's Awesome Counter is... Uh, Ian Smith, who is the son of underscore David Smith uh, on Twitter, he does um, a, a lot of apps, an awful lot of apps, um, and they're great. They're things like Widget Smith, um, and um, and uh, um, and also Watch Smith. There's another app that it can do that can do custom watch, uh, widgets for the Apple Watch or, or complications rather. And uh, Ian's awesome counter was born out of the fact that his son needed a way to keep track of him being on task or not on task. Um, and it's very difficult to show, uh, but basically, um, if I just swipe this way, you can, um, as you can see, I've not done a great job of tracking myself today, but usually I do. Um, and I can see over the day how often I've managed to actually stay on task versus not stay on task. Um, and I can also set different times to, to log stuff. So if I wanted to say at 18.15, I was on task. That was great. Um, and uh, then if I also was on task shortly before that, and then if I swipe backwards, then uh, this will update. It takes a little moment, but you can see it's got two thumbs up, which is good. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great app. You can also turn it on reminder prompts and say uh, that you would like to be on task 80% of the time or less. Um, and then it will prompt you in intervals, which you can adjust. Um, and you can also adjust all these times. So for example, if you want to be prompted to later in the day or you want to start later in the day, you can do all of that. And this is a great app. Um, it's free, which is even more amazing. And it, it can be really useful for just, I have this really long, boring, complicated task I need to do and I need something or someone to keep me on track. Well, this app will help you do it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that it exists. It was created uh, when the actual physical device that Ian was using uh, fell uh, off the side of a bridge, I believe it was, uh, when they were on holiday together. And so David and his son sat down together and wrote an Apple Watch app to solve the problem. And it's been released on the App Store. So I am um, brilliant. Um, uh, I'm brilliant. I, I, I mean, maybe you think I'm brilliant. I'm really pleased that this app exists and is brilliant because it really is wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I think Matthew had brought this up on um, uh, Smart Tech Today in the past uh, as, as a pick. And uh, I think it's a really great idea. Uh, I'm glad it's out there. Wow, I'm really shaded from the sun and uh, my, mm -hmm. my cap. So I'm rocking a sun cap. It has an O and an R on it, I think. I don't know what that O and R. Um, O'Reilly, maybe? Sure. The, the people, I, th I think they make uh, like uh, surf gear oh, and stuff like that. That's probably um, what it is that you know more than I do. Uh, yeah. But this is a really nice sun hat. I mean, the, the, the line is perfect for keeping my eyes out of the sun. I might have to run away with this hat uh, for, for next time I go to the beach. All right. Um, the app that I'm talking about today 
is called, it's got a great name, McClockface. Uh, McClockface is available in the App Store for $1.99. And this app lets you uh, create a widget for your iPhone home screen that will um, let you just have a nice clock on your home screen. Now, there are some, there are a bunch of different settings for this clock. So if I tap the settings option in the top right corner, you can see that you can use a 24 hour clock if you're like Rosemary. Uh, or for me, I turned that off because I would use a 12 hour clock because we're weird in the United States. And you can adjust to even have the seconds. So if I, if I turn that toggle off, then it shows you the seconds down at the bottom, but I'll tap that again and turn it back on. And then there's also a nightstand mode, which is kind of cool. Uh, if you charge your phone overnight and so it's always got power to it, you you can turn this on to keep the screen on and use this as a clock that you could check uh, on your nightstand. I don't necessarily recommend that. Uh, that is a lot to um, that is a lot to have to to work with, but uh, I think it's a kind of a cool feature. Then there's um, date style, uh, which has the f you can choose the full length date or a long date. I like to have the day of the week involved in mine so that I know. I know it goes all the way down to compact date uh, appearance, which you can have as your system appearance or set it to dark or light. And then you can change the app icon. I went with a simpler one than the one that comes standard with McClockface. Uh, and then look, you can go as far as to change the design. So regular, rounded, monospaced, and serif, those are all Apple's typefaces. Um, that's SF, uh, SF Pro, uh, SF Pro Rounded, SF... Wait, I can't remember what their mono space to typeface is called, but it's not, I don't think it's SF. San Francisco Mono. Yeah, SF Mono, thank you. Um, and then New York is the name of their serif typeface. And then one of my favorites, Futura, which is not an Apple typeface, but is a, an external one that has lots of different options there. And then you could also change the font weight. Um, and then individual color options for the uh, digits, the digital watch, uh, annual progress, day progress, and futuristic clock. And then if you'd like, you could also set up a gentle whistle sound for hours, and you can also set up a tick tock, tick tock option. Now, uh, from here, I could just take and uh, add this to my home screen. And of course, it will show a smaller version of this clock. So it's just a simple way to get a clock on your home screen that looks really cool. And I love this uh, old school kind of, I think, what is it called? Like a clackerboard um, style face, a pretty neat um, clock. And again, available for $1.99 uh, in the app store as a widget for both iPad OS and iOS. Uh, and, and the name is great too. Clocky yes. McClockface. Um, we do have some uh, live follow-up uh, from the chat room. Scooter X has found out that OR stands for outdoor research, but the hat is not currently available on the website. They have something that looks similar, but it's made of fleece, which is a shame because I quite like that hat, Micah. I think maybe, just maybe, it might be a tad more practical for the sun than, you know. Yeah, than the hot, the hot dog. dog. Yeah. Possibly. Maybe. P perhaps. I don't, I don't know. That that's, The hot dog might attract all the sun and absorb it and get, you know, nice and cooked. And then, then you have to take it off. But Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know. I'm feeling like even your dogs probably would enjoy this particular <laughs> one. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All right, folks, um, we love answering your questions and getting your feedback here on the show. So if you've got some of that, send it to iostoday at twit.tv. You can also tweet at us with the hashtag AskIOSToday. I know that doesn't leave you a whole lot of room, so a lot of you end up emailing us or messaging us in uh, the Discord or elsewhere. We can get the feedback there, too. Um, we record this show live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, and we love for those of you uh, who want to, to tune in live and watch us create the show by going to twit.tv slash live. But as we always say, the best way to get the show is by subscribing to it. You can do that by going to twit.tv slash iOS, where you can subscribe to the show in audio and video formats across a bunch of different providers. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Gas, Spotify. Oof, the list goes on and on because we try to be everywhere uh, that uh, you are. And uh, yeah, we, we appreciate you for, for joining and subscribe, or excuse me, for f subscribing or following, depending on the verb that you use. Uh, now's a good time to mention this really cool service we have. It's called Club Twit. Uh, for seven bucks a month, you can get access to all of our shows with no ads. 
You also get that warm, fuzzy feeling in your chest because you're supporting us directly, uh, which is incredibly helpful. Access to a members-only uh, Twit Plus bonus feed that has content you won't find anywhere else. And last but not least, you get access to the Club Twit Discord server, where you can chat with hosts and producers, it's just a wonderful chat app that lets you uh, communicate across all sorts of things. We've got, you know, different uh, means of, of uh, sharing your thoughts on all kinds of categories and also uh, chatting with us live during the show, sharing links, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of that's available for seven bucks a month. You just head to twit.tv slash club twit to check it out. Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? Uh, well, you can go to rosemaryorchard.com that has links to all the stuff I do, uh, podcasts, books, et cetera, um, and uh, where you can find me online, including Twitter and micro.blog with the username Rosemary Orchard. But of course, I'm always lurking in the Twit Discord. So uh, if you if you post something in the iOS Today channel, then I'll definitely see it. If you post it in Smart Tech Today, I might see it as well because, you know, I like hanging out there too. Aww. Um, awesome. Well, you can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. Yes, that's a real site. C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Uh, I should let you know that next week you will be seeing Matthew Casanelli uh, in my place. Not literally in my place, but uh, he will be joining the show with Rosemary Orchard. Uh, so that should be a fantastic episode, as I will be out of office next Next week. Um, so thank you to Matthew Casanelli for stepping in. And of course, thank you, Rosemary Orchard, for being here. Um, it should be an excellent show because you'll have two folks who know a trillion D billion things about shortcuts. And uh, I think Shortcuts Corner is going to be popping off next week. Yeah. I mean, feel free to send us all of your shortcuts questions. And I mean, if we got enough, then we could just maybe just do just the topic make that the show. as well. Because, you know, if, you, if you've got lots and lots of questions, um, then uh, we're, we're willing to answer them. And I'm sure Matthew's got a bunch of great tips because he is all in on shortcuts as well. Absolutely. Folks, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of iOS Today. Uh, Rosemary, we'll see you next week. I'll see you the week after. And uh, yeah, until then, we say goodbye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.